Hi again, Biology 300 students. This is Mr. Gales. Today I'm bringing you the very first screencast in our new unit, which is called Genetics. In this screencast session, you're not going to be taking notes on a note-taking template or answering learning targets as part of your note-taking. Instead, you're going to be using your packet. So you need to make sure that you have here your genetics packet, the one that says genetics up at the top and has this picture of um, Gregor Mendel on the front of it. We're going to talk about Mendel a little bit later in this unit. Today, what we're really going to be talking about are some background concepts that are important for you to understand if you're going to really understand genetics. And those concepts relate to chromosomes and a process called meiosis. Now, you may be thinking meiosis, that sounds a little bit like mitosis, and you'd be absolutely right. Like mitosis, meiosis is a process that involves the division of, the, of cells and the separation of chromosomes. It's a little bit different in that it involves the production of what we refer to as gametes, which are sexual reproductive cells. So today we're going to focus on chromosomes and the process of meiosis. You'll be doing some activities in class that will support that. And then uh, as we move forward into genetics, the material that you learn here will help you to understand Mendel's laws of heredity. So let's begin by looking here at what we are taking a look at. I'm looking at page 21 in your genetics packet. So if you'd flip open to page 21, we're going to mark up this diagram a little bit. First of all, what we're looking at on this page is a picture that's referred to as a karyotype. Okay, so you're going to write that in. This is a karyotype. A karyotype is a photo of paired chromosomes. Okay, a photo of paired chromosomes. And as you may guess, the word karyo refers to nucleus. You'll recall prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Nucleus re or karyo refers to the nucleus. So karyotype is the type of chromosomes that we find in the nucleus of the cells. What you'll notice is that these chromosomes are paired up, and they're paired up um, by generally by the size of the chromosomes, but also kind of by the banding patterns that you see here. So I'm going to take a look here at pair number two. This is a nice clear pair for us to take a look at. And when we have a pair of chromosomes like this that looks very similar, these are referred to as homologous or a homologous pair of chromosomes. Now, homologous pairs of chromosomes are the same size and shape, and they carry the same genes or genes for the same traits. And with homologous chromosomes, the reason we have two of them is we get one from each parent. So in a homologous pair of chromosomes, we'll have one that comes from the mother, one comes from the father. This would be referred to as the maternal chromosome. This one might be referred to as the paternal chromosome. Okay, now in a human karyotype like we're looking at here, there are a total of 46 chromosomes. And the way that we're going to tell that is we look at the, the numbers here. There are 22 pairs, and then there's an additional two chromosomes here that we'll talk about in a moment. So we have 46 total chromosomes. Okay. Now, the chromosomes that are in numbered pairs are referred to as autosomes. And that's a key idea. Autosomes are any non-sex chromosomes. So these are the chromosomes that are not involved in determining the gender of an of a individual, but they carry genes for other traits. Uh, the autosomes come in 22 homologous pairs. or you could say that there are 44 total autosomes. Now, the last pair of chromosomes down here that's not numbered but is designated as either Y or X are referred to as sex chromosomes. All 
Right? Sex chromosomes, as the name implies, determine the gender of an individual. Okay. So again, they are either designated as X or Y. There is one pair of sex chromosomes, or two total. Now, the X chromosome, as you can tell by looking at the picture, tends to be longer. So we're going to show it kind of like this. And the Y chromosome is much shorter. We show it generally as just a small, very small chromosome. This picture shows the karyotype for a male individual. In genetics, we're going to use this symbol to represent male. And so the sex chromosome pattern for a male individual is XY. In genetics, we use this symbol to represent female. Okay? And the sex chromosome pattern for a female is designated as XX. So that's a little bit of background about chromosomes as we begin looking at this process called meiosis, which will help us to understand how genetics works. And before we go through the nuts and bolts of meiosis, we need to talk a little bit about why meiosis is important. And what I have here is a little drawing that explains to you why meiosis is a critical step um, for sexual reproduction. So we're going to start off over here in a world without meiosis. And you can see I've got my wonderful stick figures here. I've got the man. He's got 46 chromosomes in his cells. If you'll remember from when we studied uh, the cell cycle and mitosis, we call the body cells of an individual diploid. That means there are two of each kind of chromosome. There's, there's a full set of chromosomes. So in this individual, there are 46 cells. And in, in this woman here, there are 46 uh, chromosomes as well. Now, in a world without meiosis, what would happen is if these two individuals were to make their sexual reproductive cells, the male cell is of course known as the sperm and the female cell is known as the ovum or the egg. Uh, without meiosis, they would just have 46 chromosomes in each of those cells that we now call gametes. And when reproduction would occur, you'd end up with an offspring that would have 92 chromosomes. 92 chromosomes gonna pr is going to produce a human offspring that might have three arms and two eggs and a devil's tail and maybe two heads. Not really. It's not going to do that, um, but obviously the chromosome number is going to be very far off from what is normal, and so that's not going to allow for the uh, correct development of that individual. So instead, our biological world is a world with meiosis. Sexual reproduction relies on meiosis to, pr to produce sexual reproductive cells. So with meiosis, we have our two individuals who each have 46 chromosomes in their body cells. Those are their diploid somatic body cells. They have special kinds of cells called germ cells, which are also diploid, but undergo this process called meiosis. And in meiosis, the end product for a male is a sperm cell that has 23 chromosomes. And for a female, it is an egg or an ovum, again, that has 23 chromosomes. In each of those gametes, by the way, there would be 22 autosomes and then one of the sex chromosomes. So these gametes, having only half of the chromosome content or having only one from each pair, is referred to as haploid, and that's designated as N. So the haploid number for a human is 23. And this time when the sperm fertilizes the egg, we end up with an offspring that has 46 chromosomes in it, which is just right for human reproduction. So what does this process look like? Well, you're going to find out that it looks a lot like mitosis did. So if you flip to page 25 in your genetics packet, this is a diagram that shows you the different stages of meiosis. And what we're really going to concentrate on are sort of the big ideas related to meiosis, and we're going to try to be able to identify some of the major events that occur. First of all, what is meiosis? Meiosis is a cell division process. That produces gametes. And gametes, again, is a, a fancy term for sex cells, the sperm and the egg. Okay, And these gametes have half of the number of chromosomes as the somatic cells. So gametes have one half the number of chromosomes as somatic cells.
And do you remember the term we used to describe that when the chromosomes, when there's not a pair of chromosomes, when there's half as much genetic information? We again said that that was haploid. We used the designation N, and we described that as haploid. It's kind of easy to remember because it sounds like half. Okay. Now, what happens with the process of meiosis? There are actually two divisions in, of meiosis. There's meiosis 1, and you can see there's prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase 1. And then there's prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase 2. And in many ways, these are very similar to mitosis. There's just a few differences that we'll take a look at here. Um, first of all, the big idea that we need to learn about where this happens, these, uh, th this process of meiosis happens in what is referred to as germ cells. And those germ cells are found in either the testes in men or the ovaries in women. Okay? And in those cells, the chromosome content is diploid. Right? So there's a total number of uh, diploid chromosomes. There's two of each kind. Now on this picture, I know it's a little bit difficult to see, but there are two short chromosomes and two tall chromosomes, if you look carefully here. So we're going to use that number here as we go through this example. We would say that 2n equals 4, because that's the full number of chromosomes. There's two pairs of chromosomes there for a total of four chromosomes. Now over the course of the entire mitotic division, I'm going to zoom out just a little bit so we can see the whole picture here. Over the course of that whole division, what will occur is a reduction in chromosome number. Okay, we're going to reduce the chromosome number by half, and what we end up with at the end are what we refer to as the haploid, sorry, it would be the haploid uh, gametes, which you remember are sex cells, the sperm and the egg. And haploid, in this case, has half the genetic information. So on this example, each of these cells has two chromosomes in it. Okay. Uh, now, one way that we can represent this that is, makes it maybe a little bit easier for you to see is I'm going to draw some shapes here and ask you to draw those shapes on your page as well. So here, a diploid cell, we could represent a diploid cell um, with a 2n as, as 4 or a 2n as 6 here. Um, Actually, let's do 2n is 6, so the haploid number for this cell, this would be the diploid number, would be 6. Uh, that would mean that we, there would be 6 total chromosomes and that they would occur in pairs. That's what diploid means. So a way to represent that with shapes would be I'd have maybe 2 chromosomes that were X-shaped, and I'd have 2 chromosomes that were checkmark shaped, and then maybe 2 chromosomes that were like squiggly line shaped. Okay? What that just indicates is that it's diploid. There's 2 of each kind of chromosome. In this case, the total number is 6. Now, over here at the gametes, if we use that as our example, what would the gamete look like? Well, the gamete, remember, is going to be half as many chromosomes. We're going to reduce down by half, and haploid means that there are no pairs of chromosomes. So that means there's going to be, in these cells that result, one of each kind. So we would have here one check mark and one X and one squiggly mark, kind of. Okay? Now, that's the process of meiosis. Now, one big thing that does occur during meiosis if you zoom in real carefully here, you'll see that in prophase one, there's something called crossing over. And we'll talk about that in class a little bit more, but essentially crossing over increases genetic diversity. And the way that it does that is that pieces of the chromosomes are actually exchanged during this process. You'll see this as we look at some animations in class, but it increases the variability of the con genetic content of each chromosome. Uh, now, we're going to take a look at a couple of other pages. first thing I want you to take a look at is on page 26. Page 26 is essentially how meiosis and, uh, occurs in male and females. Um, we're obviously using humans as an example here. Uh, in males, and again, we use the symbol. This is the symbol for male. The process is referred to as spermatogenesis, the production of sperm. And this occurs in the testes. Right? Uh, so we would say that the diploid germ cell for a human being, the diploid number is 46, right? And then in meiosis 1, we have a division. And in meiosis 2, we have a further division. And the total, the total outcome or the total objective of meiosis, the meiosis divisions, is to produce then what we call haploid gamete cells. So what we end up with in spermatogenesis is 4 equal 
haploid gametes. And we would say here that the N number for those gametes, the number of chromosomes in each human gamete for a male is 23. Okay. Now over here on the female side, the process is referred to as oogenesis. Remember that the proper term for the egg is the ovum, so this is the oogenesis. This occurs in the ovaries. And just for practice, let's make sure that you put in the symbol for female. Okay. Again, we have a, a meiosis division. Meiosis 1, there's a slightly unequal division of the cytoplasm here. So we have one secondary egg cell that's produced and then something called a polar body that's produced. And then in the second meiotic division, we end up with another egg cell that gets produced and then more polar bodies. Uh, the polar bodies are cells essentially that die off. What ends up being produced here is one haploid gamete, right? It's the egg cell or the ovum. And the haploid number for that cell is still going to be 23. Now, the reason for the unequal distribution here is that this egg cell is going to require much nutrition after it becomes fertilized. So these polar bodies essentially give up a lot of their cytoplasm and their, their nutrition to the egg cell so that it has more um, to nourish that growing zygote, that growing embryo. Okay. Now we're going to take one last look at a page that relates to the reproductive life cycle in human beings. And if you take a look now on page 33, okay, what we have on page 33 is the human reproductive life cycle. And we start off looking at the multicellular diploid. These are adult cells. Diploid 2n equals 46. Uh, this occurs in germ cells. So when we look at meiosis, we're looking at germ cells, remember? The germ cells for females are the ovaries in the ovaries and for males they are in the testes. Now what happens here is meiosis is going to reduce the chromosome number okay. in males in the testes we have what's called spermatogenesis and in females the process is called oogenesis. And the end result in either case would be haploid gametes that have an end number of 23. For females, it would be the ovum. For males, it would be the sperm. Um, fertilization is where we reunite. It's when the, the egg and sperm join. And what that does is it restores the diploid number. So now the, the first diploid cell which is referred to as a zygote, has the total diploid number of 46. By the way, a zygote would be uh, fancy biology speak for what we call a fertilized egg. Okay. Now, we all began our lives as zygotes, and what happens is from that initial single fertilized egg, we go through the process of mitosis and development, just like we learned in our cell cycle uh, unit, and we eventually end up being multicellular diploid adults. All right, so in today's screencast, we've gone through some information about chromosomes, some important uh, definitions related to how we look at a carrier type of chromosomes, and then a basic understanding of meiosis, the overall goal of meiosis, some of the names of the cells that are involved, the differences between diploid and haploid. In class, you'll be doing some practice activities that will help you to understand this, and then we'll go to the next step, which is understanding when meiosis doesn't happen quite correctly. Okay, so... For next time, this is Mr. Gales, and I'll see you in biology class.